And, uh, uh, you know, we'll run through the schedule pretty much as we did. I guess it'll start a little bit later than we planned. And there may be a little bit of wiggling around in it, but uh, you know, it should go pretty much as it is. Um, so my name is uh, Byron Foley. And uh, read a... Uh, uh, for John Easley and Jim Shepard and Glenn Spearman and Dick Higgins and Ray Bremser. It would be disingenuous to say that all my friends are dying, or even to say that everyone I know who's dying was my friend. But this fall, 1998, a year or two years, your choice, before the millennium, the cold wind that usually sweeps my spirits up every year at this time of year is apparently blowing so damn hard that people are flying right off the goddamn planet. I don't know. In general, when the leaves come off the trees and the color comes off the hills, my sense is that we're getting a chance to see things as they really are. To see the bones of the planet without the stuff that usually dolls it up. And that seems like a good thing. But this year, the grayness of the rocks and the rocky grayness of the cloud sheets hanging and shifting over the top of my valley seem to imply a blandness of spirit creeping up, trying to offer us a future infinitely duller than the future we'd imagined. John Easley was what, maybe 30 or so, and I hadn't seen him in years, but the memory of his massive bulk flung sideways through the air while he blatted punk lyrics in front of a bunch of Harvard kids is pretty fresh. Now that he's gone with a bang, my connection with that whole scene seems even more tenuous than it should. Jim Shepard was my age in a little mid-40s or something, I guess, and he could be a difficult guy. But he was one of the great inventors of our time. His musical vision was so personal and so homemade. He'd already overcome so many problems. It always seemed like he had the stuff to turn his problems into art. He figured out that out for me. The only thing that'll save any of us. So you've got to wonder where it leads a lot of people who weren't as evil. Glenn Spearman was 51, and Jesus had been sick for so long. You almost started to think he was right. He wasn't sick. But I guess he knew it was the end after he was back east the last time, and I guess he was right about that. And on one hand, I'm glad he died the way he did, in bed, not in some goddamn punk alley in Oakland. But man, I wish I could hear him play one more time. Because he was, for me, more than anyone else I've known, the connection to the original part of jazz freedom. Dick Higgins was 60 or so, and I only saw him do a performance once in New York a long time ago. I never even really met him, except through letters I wrote him a couple times. Because when I did see him at parties a few other times, I was really just a kid. He seemed pretty weird and imposing, the way 40-year-olds do when you're 20, and drunk, in a place you're not really supposed to be. Or at least since you're 20, you don't think you're supposed to be there. But there are aspects of his thinking that have colored my way of doing things more than any real teacher. And the thought that there will be no more of his new projects on the horizon makes me feel kind of lightheaded. Ray Browser was in his 60s too, although he looked like he was a million. God damn, I guess he was sicker and shit when we saw him in Cherry Valley. But you wouldn't have known it since he really had his wily geezer act down. And it sure seemed like more than half his barrels were firing since he honestly gave us as good a raft of shit as you'd get from someone his age who was feeling every one of his oats, which he wasn't. But Weinberg says that when he last saw Ray in the hospital about two hours before he died, he was asking to hear some Coltrane, which would make for a pretty good passage. 
So I guess he had his act together till the end. I can only hope that John and Jim and Glenn and Dick had something approaching the beautiful transportational power of Coltrane's visions blowing through their heads before the wind washed over them for the last time. Sometimes self-righteous curs like to say something good comes from death, that there are lessons taught, that there are dreams passed on, that there is a natural rhythm to existence, one which predicates a certain number of snuffs. And all this may be so, and all these guys kicked death in the ass enough times that perhaps they could no longer confound it by the constant motion of their brains, of their souls, and their bodies. But there are no lessons to be learned from their deaths. There's only a sense that there are now five fewer bags to push against the envelope and help us keep the great gray mass from becoming a permanent condition, a heavy static haze slowly binding the efforts of everyone who's still around fighting in tropic gush in big ways or small. It would be wrong to say they have not left vestiges, but what can we do except burn their bodies and scatter their ashes and hope that we or someone can keep building Castles of resistance on a mound of dead fighters growing slowly higher every year. I'd like to think the clouds I see this fall are the smoke of Kathy Acker and William Burroughs and Herbert Hunky and Allen Ginsberg and Jack Micheline and Dennis Charles and Robert Palmer and everyone else whose death has preceded my own. But I don't think it's so and that more than sucks. Maybe next year, when the trees go bare, my world turns into a granite quarry overnight, I'll be able to see it with fresh eyes. But this fall, this goddamn mountain of a fall, 1998, I ain't into it, and I may never be into it quite the same way again.